Hello, it's Friday, March 9th, 2018, and as of this recording, I'm still depressed, but I'm not dead. So, I don't remember the year, and I haven't been able to get a hold of my mom recently to ask her, um... But I remember distinctly a conversation that I had with my mom um, when she asked me, um, it's kind of just one of those kind of open-ended kind of questions, um, just kind of musing about the state of relationships and whatnot. But I was young, probably eight, I'm thinking eight, nine, or 10. Um, But she asked me, distinctly I remember her asking me, what happened to the JP that used to talk to me all the time. And I, of course, didn't have an answer for her, and I felt pretty awkward about it um, and didn't want to have a conversation about that. And I bring this up as a way to, you know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to pinpoint, you know, when my mental illnesses started to take hold, when they... You know, when I started going from a kid who, you know, played, you know, shot baskets at a friend's down the street um, or played with friends at the playground and got hit in the nose with a (laughs) a seesaw and uh, got home a big bloody mess. Um, But when I went from, you know, that kid who, who played with friends to someone who, you know, pulled away, didn't, didn't play with friends as much, had maybe one or two people that I considered a friend, um, but never really had discussions with, never, never had that best friend who, you know, you sit around and talk about the, the, the stuff of life. So I need to get a hold of mom and ask her if she remembers that, um, she probably doesn't remember the conversation, uh, but I do. And, I'd like to find out when that was, you know, 19, what, 1980, 81, um, something like that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, This is something that kind of popped in my head the other day. And, well, just before the last episode, I wanted to bring it up, but I forgot. Um, So, yeah, so there's that. Um, I want to try doing something a little different with the show. I want to try to save my begging and pleading for rates and reviews and contacts and things like that to the end. Maybe have the first little little bit be a little story like that. Um, something that's more, more engaging, hopefully, to you guys than listening to me start off the show with, hey, send me an email. Hey, you know, pat me on the back. Hey, whatever. Yeah, so let's get into it. I was chatting with a friend of the show, Squid. Uh, we go by nicknames only, Squid and Jamulki, um, which is awesome. I think Squid is a fantastic nickname. And I was asking, you know, I was just kind of lamenting the fact that I was trying, having a hard time coming up with the next episode um, topic. And Nora had happened to send me a link on Facebook um, to an article. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. To an article that basically said that um, my anxiety convinces me that everyone hates me. And I started reading through this woman's story. It's by Holly Riordan. I'm not really sure. Um, it's off thoughtcatalog.com. I'll put a link in the show notes for you if you want to read it. And some of the things that she was saying rang true to me, made me feel like reminded me of the way I act and react to different things. And so, you know, reading it, I, 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 I realized that I don't have a lot of knowledge about anxiety and how it relates to me, if it relates to me, um, how it fits in with my diagnoses. Um, but her little article here really made me think, yeah, maybe, maybe it is anxiety that I'm dealing with. Um, and stuff I'll, I'll talk about, which tucks in, you know, gets into sending text messages or 
you know, feeling like if something bad can happen, it will happen, um, and stuff like that. So I started doing a little research and looking into it, and I, I did a, a Google search of anxiety or avoidant personality disorder, and it changes right away to um, social anxiety or avoidant personality disorder. And so I'm not sure what the difference is between general anxiety or social anxiety um, just yet, but I, 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 I will get into that. I wanted to bring it up at DBSA. The DBSA group I go to um, the other night, but you know a lot of folks there talk about how they feel it. You know they have anxiety, as well as depression or bipolar, as well as anxiety or whatnot. Um, and I never include anxiety because that's not not what's been discussed with me. And apologies if my voice isn't quite all the way back to normal. I'm trying my best here. Um, so yeah, so Nora had sent me this article. And I read it, and I thought, I said to Squid, maybe I'll do an episode about anxiety. And Squid said, wow, that would be great. I've kind of wondered about that um, myself. And so I set off to, to learn about anxiety and me and see how it really affects me. And in fact, they'll say, oh, oh that could be good. I've been curious about it. Well, interesting point that, that Squid made was... Um, they always got the inclination that anxiety didn't hit me very hard because of the old whole anhedonia thing. Um, and I don't know, you know, Squid, I don't know about that either. Um, my guess is that, well, as I'll get into why I think I don't really suffer from anxiety, um, I think, you know, the anhedonia is relatively new, you know, four years, five years, something like that, um, as opposed to the, the time, you know, if we, if we go way back to, you know, when I was eight, nine, ten, you know, where's, where's the JP that used to talk to me all the time, if we go back that far, um, you know, I don't, you know, I remember I was not suffering from anhedonia at that time, I don't believe, so, but I really love that insight, um, and that's the kind of stuff that, that I love getting from you guys out there. Um, so like I said, if, if I do a search of anxiety and uh, avoidant personality disorder, it switches to social anxiety and avoidant personality disorder. And everything that I read is that they are very similar, but um, those who have avoidant personality disorder um, may feel the symptoms more severely um, and are more broad ranging is the the phrase I keep hearing more severe, more broad ranging. And so, you know, I have a couple web pages pulled up here that I wanted to refer to. So let's get into it. I know I did one episode where I talked about this a bit, so I hope I'm not repeating myself too much. So, um, and I'll read right from an article here from very well mind.com. Um, it said, like social anxiety disorder, the central fear of people with avoidant personality disorder is rejection, ridicule, and humiliation by others. Um, however, people with avoidant personality disorder have a broader range of symptoms, and the symptoms are more severe. In this way, avoidant personality disorder is has more to do with a person's personality and may appear more stable over time and from one situation to another, while social anxiety disorder tends to separate itself from the personality and may come and go depending on the social situation. Um, and because of that, it may be easier to change or treat. And this isn't, you know, who carries the biggest stick kind of thing. I'm just kind of giving you guys the information that, that I see and read. Um, and a lot of what I've read is, you know, folks with social anxiety disorder, um, well, I guess I shouldn't speak to that because I, 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 I don't, I don't, I have not been diagnosed with that. I, I could have been diagnosed with that when I took the, um, the MMPI, uh, back when, but it came back avoidant personality. So I'm going to just talk about that. So some of the things that are symptomatic for someone with AV, AVPD, APD, we'll call it, we'll just say APD to shorten it for now. Um, is that, you know, I tend to have very low self-esteem, um, 
super strong feelings of inadequacy um, and a, a really strong sensitivity to rejection. So one of the things that was in this initial article that Nora sent me was that this person was talking about sending text messages and kind of the angst that's filled with that. And I get that 100%. If, you know, I feel like if I send a text message to someone and I don't hear back really soon, that I feel like I'm bothering them or they're mad at me. And if I get like a one word sentence back, um, like good or yes or whatever, I feel like the person is mad at me that I did something wrong, um, that they won't give me the time to explain a little bit farther, fur further, farther, further of, you know, what their response is. And, um, you know, I can think of this happening back um, well into my, my first marriage. Um, and even now with Nora, as wonderful as Nora is, if I send her a Facebook message and I don't hear for back from her, um, or even the worst is, you know, when you see that she's online, but in Facebook Messenger, it tells you if they've read the message or not. And she's online and hasn't read the message. Um, my mind automatically goes to, oh, she's what, what did I do? She's mad at me. She won't even look at my message. Um, geez, she must know it's there because, you know, it, it flashes or, or whatever it does on her end. Um, and I'm able to deal with it a little bit better now with, with Nora at least because, you know, she's always telling me how much she loves me and how she cares for me and, um, and all that so I can I can calm myself from that a little bit um, I, I put a lot of stock into the things that she tells me um, but it's there uh, you know if I'm texting with one of the girls uh, or Dave or Scott and you know there's a lapse you know like I, I whatever I send a, a line that maybe is a little joke or even just you know a response in the conversation and there's a lapse before they get back to me, I start reanalyzing the last thing that I sent to figure out what what happened that they're ticked off at me now. What happened that they no longer want to speak to me. And that's exactly what it feels like. And this is, you know, this isn't a cry or a plea for people to, hey, message me back right away. Um, but that's ex that that is what it feels like to me that's you know if messages are flying you know one one every minute or something like that back and forth and, and i know people have have lives and they're working and kids and all that um or just attention span when it comes to my girls um but when there's that gap i immediately turn to oh crap what did i do wrong what oh no they don't like me anymore they don't care for me they don't they think I'm an idiot they oh then now they know I'm an idiot oh now they see me for who I am and yeah that's that's a real thing um, so going down the list a little bit farther um, so in new social settings you will become extremely self-conscious shy or inhibited and will be preoccupied with being criticized or rejected and I don't know why it says new social settings in there. Um, the next line is you tend to view yourself as socially inept, personally unappealing or inferior to others. And that is absolutely true. Um, and like I said, in any social setting, I worry about being criticized or being wrong or being shown to be weak. I hate, um, I won't, do things or say things that I'm not absolutely sure about or at least know enough to say I don't know about that. And even you know, I hate doing that even sometimes. Um, so I won't do things in the social settings, even with family, with best friends, with heck, even with Nora, uh, my girls, for fear of looking like the sub person that I see myself as and you know it, it makes me withdraw it makes me um, maybe it makes me come off as aloof uh, at times 
but um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of an example, you know, a real life example. <laughs> but uh, you know, even things like like singing or humming or you know, tapping out a beat or um, I don't know, you know, chiming in with an opinion on something. Oh my gosh, if if there's a conversation and, and it turns to wanting my opinion, there's no way you're going to get my opinion from it because for sure my opinion is the total epitome of trash. And yeah, there's no way that that, that I will give my opinion on anything. Um, even if it's based on, on something that I know very well, I know it to be fact. Um, I won't give an opinion based on that. I will maybe regurgitate facts or, you know, what, what I've learned, but you know, Hey JP, what do you think about this? And I, uh, eh, eh, I don't know. I don't know. It's always, I don't know, or it doesn't really matter to me. Um, Nora and I were talking about, you know, she's looking at houses down in the Raleigh area for when we move. Um, and she wants my opinion and I always tell her as long as it's, you know, warm in the winter and cool in the summer and doesn't leak, then what do I care? And, you know, I, I, I do have opinions. There's things that I like and things that I don't like in a house, but I'm not going to express that to her because heck she loves me she cares about me right now why why do i want to ruin that by offering up an opinion that might be in you know opposition to her own why not just keep the boat from rocking you know just keep it going nice and smooth and and as i'm saying this i this is it's idiotic you know hearing myself talk about it this way talking about you know what kind of countertop you like in the kitchen or you know new house new new construction or old or whatnot you know these are not relationship changing things they're they're not but when it comes to giving my opinion in my head everything is relationship changing everything is image changing image changing everything is has the potential to spoil what goodness I may have with a particular person. And this is, you know, from, from Nora right down to strangers. Um, I just won't do it. I won't, I won't step out of any kind of secluded, isolated comfort zone to offer up opinion or disagree. My goodness, disagree with someone. You've got to be kidding me. Um, to go in direct opposition, even, even times when I know that, that I'm right. Um, you know, let's talk about, you know, we're talking about global climate change and I've done quite a bit of reading on that. So I, I know I've got facts, but you know, someone suggests something different or something that's not right. I won't, I won't do anything to remedy that situation because holy cow, what, who am I to be questioning you about what you believe you know about what you think about what you what your opinion is so yeah there's that um so another one of the big ones is um and it's not quite right but um but i you know tend to avoid relationships unless you are certain that the other person likes you um and that's absolutely true i you know won't i will keep many people at arm's length, um, un until I know that they, for whatever reason, like me, because it avoids, I won't, I won't get hurt that way, right? If I meet someone new and, you know, and it, it could take weeks or months for me to think that they like me. And even then, it, and then it becomes more difficult in the fact that Oh my gosh, I've waited this long. What maybe they don't like me anymore. But yeah, and that, and that gets into why folks with APD happen to have tend to have fewer friends, um which is exactly what's going on in my life. Um I've got you know my brother-in-law Mike, who's a really great guy and there's no reason why I shouldn't 
you know, be able to, you know, have a friendly relationship with him. But, you know, I, I, I don't because that's, I just don't, I don't, I, I can't, I don't know, to, to, to put myself out there to be open to a friendship is, it's a very frightening thing. It's a very off-putting thing. Yeah, I got in and we were, we were supposed to be talking about how similar APD and social anxiety disorder are. Um, and really I'm just going through a laundry list of who I am. Um, hypersensitive sensitivity to cr criticism, constant fear of rejection. Um, yeah, those are, you know, what, what I was just talking about, about voicing my opinion or contradicting someone. Um, opening myself up to being criticized for my view, my worldview or my scientific view or my personal view or whatever. Believing that you are unwelcome in social situations, regardless of whether such feelings have any basis in reality. Um, that's kind of, in a way, I think of that as like the the person who was always standing on the outside of a conversation. And that's me. Um, I don't have any problem standing around and listening to other people talk and gives me an opportunity to learn, maybe learn something new um, or maybe just frustrate the hell out of me and I walk away. But um, yeah, I don't feel like there are any social situations where I am a welcome part of it because I can't, Again, this, this is me thinking, I guess, um, the way I think, the way I react. But I can't um, offer anything up to that social situation. If, you know, if it's a group of friends, if it's just people watching basketball, if it's, you know, Nora, her mom, and me at the dinner table, if it's, you know, my mom, even with my girls, I, I tend to be, you know, on the outside looking in. Um, always available to them, but never feel like I can interject myself into, you know, whatever they're doing, you know, and a lot of what they're doing is social media on their phones and, you know, whatnot. But the point is that it, it's, it's present in every kind of relationship in my life. And I don't know how to change that. So then we get into treatment, right? How do you treat such a thing? Um, Cognitive behavioral therapy, which, you know, CBT training, social skill training, group therapy, medication, all similar things that you would do for someone with social anxiety disorder and a lot of the same medications too. So what am I doing? How am I trying to get better at this? Uh, one is this podcast, two is, you know, the, the text line or emails or Facebook, um, trying to hold up those conversations, which, which, you, you know, that's, it's interesting. I, I see those as a little bit different than, you know, my face to face interactions. Um, I really enjoy interacting and communicating with you guys. Um, when the line goes quiet, um, there's a, it's, there is quite a bit of, oh gosh, what did I, what did I do? Did I step over some boundary? But there's also, you know, hey, I hope this person is okay because given the situations that we have uh, come together, you know, it's, it's possible that you're having a really bad, rough time or worse. So I try to balance that a little bit. Um, you know, I have one friend, you know, who... You know, it's just been hanging like a big matzo ball out there. A couple of weeks ago, I sent a TGIF, how are you doing today? And I haven't heard back from, from this person. And, you know, I, I, I am, I'm afraid to send another message because if I send another message, then I'm just sticking myself in a situation where clearly they don't want me. But at the same time, I want to send a message to see how they are, if they're okay, if there's, you know, something they want to vent about. And I guess, you know, it, given what the relationship is when I, you know, I'm texting someone um, who's a listener of the show, it's pretty clear that we're never going to meet each other. And so it's a little easier for me to, to interact because it's, there's kind of that facade of almost like it's not real um, because you're just, 
you know, text coming to my phone. Um, and it's not, and, and not, to, that's not to say that's how I think of you guys. That's not to say, I think that's how I value you as people that I think there's that, um, it's muted, I guess it's muted that, you know, that, that there's that buffer between, between you and I, and it's, you know, the cell phone towers or the World Wide web or whatever. Um, so yeah, so I love getting messages from you guys. Please don't, don't stop. And one other differing thing that I've, that I found and, and I thought it was interesting was that, um, folks in, in the group of folks, which is like 3% to 10% of the population who have some form of social anxiety disorder, they, that group is much more likely to have extroverts in it. You know, people who, who love putting themselves out there in some situations, but there's just other situations where they, they have a hard time with it. And the kind of 1% of the population who may have APD um, it's very unlikely, um, it's, it's, it's rare to find an extrovert as someone who has APD. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no secret that I'm an introvert and that's not in itself. That's just an anecdote. That's not scientific proof of anything. Um, but I thought that was interesting that, you know, if you, you can be an extrovert and have social anxiety disorder. And, and I guess that makes sense. Um, because maybe, you know, you've got your three friends who are, you know, your best friends in the world and you can go to a party with them and hang out with them and, and be the loudest one in the group, but turn it around and maybe, you know, then you, maybe your job is working in the public sector and, you know, working in, you know, let's say at a retail store and maybe that fills you with dread because those are new people or it's a sit uncomfortable situation for you. Um, so I thought that was interesting. So you folks out there who um, have diagnosis of anxiety, um, well, social anxiety first, um, you know, let me know what you think about this. Let me know what you think, what I've kind of described as APD, what you think, is it, is it similar? Is it different? I mean, I'm, I stayed away from the kind of, um, real scientific websites on this one just because I'm having a hard time focusing on reading. Um, I'm, I'm reading two books with my girls right now. Uh, and that's taking up about all the mental focus that I have for reading. Um, so when it comes to other things, I'm having a hard time. Um, so let me know what, you know, if what I'm saying is just a, a whole crock of poo or what. Um, and anybody who, who has anxiety, I would love to have a conversation with you about how that impacts you, about even what, what your symptoms are and when does it, when does it impact your life? Or, you know, is it, is it cer certain situations? Is it every situation? Is it whatever? I'm, I would love to have a conversation about that. Um, and I guess we're segueing into the end here. So yeah, folks, reach out to me, uh, send me an email, jamulke at gmail.com. Visit my website, jamulke.info, facebook.com slash jamulke, at jamulke on Twitter. That's J-A-M-O-A-L-K-I. Uh, you can text me at 248-648-1419. Um, those seem to be the most lively conversations that we have, that I have going. Those of you uh, who email me, I, I'm slower to get back on email, um, mostly because they're longer form and I want to make sure that I've... I've read through it and I understand what your email is. Um, so apologies to that, but I will get back to everybody. If you could do me a favor and when you're on iTunes or wherever you download the podcast from, if you could leave a review, um, preferably good, but good or bad. If you could, if there's a rating system and could rate five stars, that would be fabulous. That would help other people find the show. Um, and I have gotten, you know, more emails lately about folks who are thankful or grateful, um, who have found some, I don't know, um, some value in the podcast and that's fantastic. And I know I want to help more people and I'd like to think that you guys want to help more people as well. So that's an easy way. Five minutes, leave me a review, leave me a five-star rating. That would be great. 
Um, Kate, if you're out there still listening, um, yeah, sorry we've kind of kind of lost contact a little bit. Hopefully we can get our conversations going back up, um, and I promise to get caught up on your blog. So everybody out there, uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to the show. You guys are amazing, and you humble me every day. So thanks for listening. Everybody be safe and be well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.